Right. Welcome to the college college admissions collaborative highlighting engineering and technology college fair. We're so excited to have you participating in this event. We have some fantastic schools here with us today. My name is Nashira and I will be your facilitator. Before we get started, a few housekeeping items. Your camera and microphone are off so the panelists cannot see or hear you. You can use the Q&A button on your screen to type your questions to our presenters at any time. This is just one of many different sessions happening, so be sure to check out the schedule on the website. This presentation is being recorded and will be available at strivescan.com forward slash cache. I'd now like to turn it over to our panel who will be talking about succeeding in STEM. Hi, Nashara. Thank you so much for your help getting us started, and good evening, everyone. My name's Amy Glenn, and let me get our, uh, my screen set up here. There we go. Um, so everyone can see that. Um, as mentioned, we are presenting on succeeding in STEM this evening, and I'm joined by some uh, great colleagues in some other uh, colleges across the U.S. So really quickly, I'll introduce myself. I'm Amy Glenn. I'm the Associate Director of the Office of Future Engineers. I do hold both my bachelor's and master's degrees from Purdue University. In between the two, two degrees, though, I left campus and realized I missed being here. I missed working with faculty and staff, but what I missed the most was working with students, so I came back to do what I do today. Um, I love inspiring future students to consider uh, careers in STEM and majors in STEM. So let me turn it over to Kristen uh, to introduce herself. Thank you, Amy. I'm delighted to be here and so excited that all of you have joined us. Um, I have been doing uh, what I jokingly say is the Lord's work of uh, helping students navigate the challenges of STEM college searches and STEM um, major selection for a couple of decades now. Um, I, I just think there are so many amazing opportunities for young people and, um, and we need every brain on the planet possible working on some of the grand challenges facing us on a daily basis. So um, so excited that you're, you're here to, to join us today. I will turn the, uh, the virtual podium over to Sarah. Hello everyone, um, over here at Rose Holman. I work on a daily basis with students, helping them to figure out what the strategies are they need to be successful in college. And so really excited about this session because we get to take you behind the scenes and give you that sort of inside scoop before you even step foot on campus. So some things to be thinking about that are gonna help you succeed um, ahead of time. So I'll turn it over to Chris. Great. Thanks, Sarah. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Chris Ramsey. I'm an assistant dean and uh, academic advisor in the McKelvey School of Engineering at Washington University in St. Louis. Uh, I'm in my uh, 10th year, all within uh, WashU Engineering and McKelvey Engineering. Uh, and all the things that have been mentioned already is why I'm here and excited. Uh, I think this is such a great opportunity. Uh, you know, a lot of these sessions you're learning about specific colleges, but we're, what we're covering today is just advice no matter where you go and uh, as it applies to STEM uh, and uh, how uh, just some tips and advice uh, for that. So we're, we're so glad you're here and, and look forward to any questions you have to add towards the end of our session as well. Awesome, thank you, Chris. Um, let's get started. So we like to first challenge students to think about um, what problems do you wanna solve in our world today? that our world is facing. Oops, let me go back up. STEM is so broad that you can work in any different industry with any different major, pretty much. So I encourage students to think more about what industries and challenges do you, are you interested in? Are you interested in uh, advanced technologies, looking at newer worlds, safer tomorrows, healthy futures, or a cleaner planet? Um, so again, all STEM majors can work in these fields. So thinking about what interests you will help you develop into what major interests you, which will be part of those keys to success. And we're going to start talking about those as well. Before we get to the college keys, though, I do quickly want to touch on some of the pre-college preparation. Um, so advanced credit is going to be very helpful uh, when you go to college. It will prepare you for the breadth and rigors of those programs that you're going to be taking, those majors and classes. 
So it's AP, IB, dual credit, whatever you're taking in school will help you a lot. Think about those courses that are going to challenge you for the majors that you wanna go into. Be involved. It's very important to have that work-life balance, uh, not only after you graduate and go into your career, but while you're in school as well. So I'm sure you're involved in a lot of things that you enjoy. Um, you might wanna consider keeping those up when you get to college or start new things. We'll talk more about that. College visits are very important. We see a lot of families visiting during the summer. Um, we're gonna to touch more on that. Um, however, go and see the colleges. And I like to talk about the three Fs, form, fit, and finances. Um, form is what style of school are you looking for? Are you looking for urban or rural or a college setting? Um, are you looking for something large with um, big 10 atmosphere? Or are you looking for a smaller, uh, more close-knit family school? Um, so that's kind of the form. The fit is, does it feel like home when you step on campus? Um, that's really important because you're gonna be there for the next four to five years. Finances, those are what they are, but there's lots of great ways to help pay for college, um, not just scholarships, and we're gonna talk more about those experiences that pay a lot. Um, and then knowing the application dates. So that's very important because that can open up doors of opportunity for you as well. We're gonna discuss three main keys to success when it comes to college, academic success, doing what you love, and gaining experience. I'm going to turn it over to Sarah now, who's going to talk about academic success. Sarah? Hi, thanks, Amy. The big idea is that college success requires college level strategies. And these are strategies that you may not have had to develop um, in the past or while you're in high school. And while this isn't an exhaustive list, um, we want to give you some ideas to be thinking about. So the first is being present in class. So successful students not only go to class, but they put away their distractions and they really engage in the environment. And so they take notes, they ask questions, they answer questions, and they participate in group activities. Um, the successful students really tap into the knowledge and expertise of faculty and advisors. Uh, faculties are experts in their field. And so along with their advisor, you're going to have help in navigating the transition to college navigating through your different courses, and even navigating beyond college as you leverage those connections and a networking opportunity. Um, some students find it intimidating to talk to faculty, um, but I try to remind them that they are regular people too, and they have interests and hobbies just like you do. And so um, it's not a situation where you're gonna walk into Professor Snape's office if you're a, a fan of Harry Potter. Doing the work. So a lot of students are able to be successful in college, or sorry, in high school, by relying on their natural intellect and ability rather than a lot of work. And so successful students recognize that college is gonna take more effort. Um, here at Rose Hallman, we use the new science of learning as our text in the first year seminar. And the mantra that we pulled from that book is the one who does the work does the learning. And the emphasis really is on learning course material, not just memorizing information the night before the exam. Asking for help is super important. Um, successful students know that they won't get through college by themselves. And at some point they're gonna to need to reach out and leverage the campus resources. So talk to your professors during office hours, visit the library and the learning center, attend those formal review sessions. Maybe it's working with accessibility services or an academic success office. You're gonna be making an investment and in a lot of different resources. So I encourage you to get a return on that investment. Um, successful students also leverage informal resources such as study groups. Um, study groups are great for helping each other to learn course content. You can test each other before an exam to see what information you know and what you don't quite know yet. And you can even leverage study groups as a way to hold yourself accountable. So if everybody needs to get work done, you can all be working together. And then the last strategy we want to talk about is treating college like a job. So the general rule of thumb in higher education is that you should be studying three hours per credit hour. And that includes going to classes and labs, um, doing homework, reading the textbook, visiting office hours, taking practice exams, all of those things that you need to do to prepare for a general class. Um, successful students know they need to create an environment that supports that learning. And so a lot of times that means doing your homework in the library or an academic space and not necessarily in your residence hall. 
And then successful students also figure out their time management schedule right away so that they can find that balance between being successful in the classroom and having social activities. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Chris to talk more about those out of classroom experiences. Uh, thanks, Sarah. So as you look at a STEM and, and in my experience, engineering, that's the school I work in, uh, certainly the academics are gonna be the priority, but the, the whole college experience uh, is very, very important uh, to not just your college experience, but your STEM experience. And, and I'll explain that in, in just a minute. So our advice is, as a panel, we very much agree uh, very enthusiastically that as you look at your schools, specifically for STEM, uh, to make sure that you're finding places that still support your other interests and passions. Um, whether if they're in STEM, certainly we would support that, but well beyond STEM uh, as well. And uh, there's, there's many reasons uh, for that. And why this is important is that uh, historically or just over the years, there's uh, these stereotypes that if you study pre-med or, or STEM, and again, in my case, engineering, uh, that uh, there's, no, there's no time for anything else. And we encourage you to look for universities and colleges that do support that because there is time. Priorities need to be made, uh, but there is time. So our advice is to not give up on the, the passions and interests that you have, uh, especially the ones that are non-STEM related. Uh, so if you're in band, if you're in choir, uh, if you're an artist, if you're in theater, if you're in student government, athletics, uh, and that is really important to you. And that's something that, that you find great joy in uh, and great experience from, then find places where that can continue uh, no matter what you're gonna study in, in college. And in this case, specifically STEM uh, for two reasons that we wanna make sure you know about. First of all, that, that's what college should be. College should be about those experiences in addition to those on the academic side. As a panel, we believe you're gonna be a better scientist or engineer if you have these experiences. Because uh, to be a, a, a successful scientist uh, or engineer or any field in STEM, uh, parts of the brain beyond just the analytical and technical uh, have, to be, have to be strong. And so uh, parts of the brain that focus on collaboration and certainly creativity and working with uh, those and collaborating with those that are not STEM uh, are incredibly important. So, uh, so this is just really important to us as a panel and, and one area that we wanted to stress today uh, that yes, if there are STEM activities, if there's a race car team, a robotics team, uh, an aerospace team uh, to be a part of within that STEM uh, or engineering focus that you definitely wanna be a part of those, uh, but, uh, but don't give up the other things uh, as, as well. And one last point I'd like to make uh, is that just advice that we kind of came up with that we think it's important for high school students to, uh, to know is that getting involved in college looks a lot different than getting involved in high school. It's just a different, uh, a bit of a different approach and in, in, in where you spend your time. So just uh, kind of remember that thought that, uh, that as you build experiences and yes, as you build your resume in high school, um, is it's gonna be different in college. And, and that's a good thing. Uh, it's just a different kind of experience. Uh, but uh, again, just in, in summary to make sure that these other activities beyond STEM that you may be a part of to not feel those have to be given up uh, as you transition into a STEM major. So, so we hope, hope you'll remember that. Uh, and with that in mind, uh, another area we very much want you to focus on, I'll have Kristen uh, cover that. Thank you, Chris. Um, one thing I hope you get out of this presentation is the fact that your interest in science and engineering and technology should not preclude your engagement in other areas. Um, we worry as educators sometimes that students hear that STEM studies are gonna be so demanding that you will not have time to have fun, to connect with friends, to explore other interests. And in truth, your engagement in those other activities will actually make you a more successful student. Um, so with that, I will tell you a little bit about the third key to success which is gaining experience. And, um, and we've featured a few different areas where you can get experience. I, I think you would probably already know this, but it bears um, calling out that, that STEM is not just about theoretical work. 
This is not just um, squirreling yourself away in front of a computer for hours on end or in a lab. STEM requires you to be hands-on. It gets messy. Um, this, is, this is kind of a fun area where you get to interact with people and materials and test the waters. So gaining experience is a really critical part of the learning process. And it's important to test your skills outside the classroom because something that might seem to work swimmingly in, an, in a conceptual setting, in truth, when you use it out in the real world, that might not work so well. And as you develop your skills as a problem solver, we think it's really important for you to, while you're still in college, get some real world experience using those skills. And frankly, um, it, it helps you remember what you're learning uh, more so than just regurgitating answers on a test per se. The first way to gain experience that I just wanna spend a little bit of time talking about has to do with getting out of your comfort zone, uh, physically, geographically, um, going other places. So international experiences. Uh, again, one um, myth that we would like to debunk is that if you're majoring in engineering in college, you won't have time or um, you won't be given the opportunity to study outside the US. That is not the case. There are lots of colleges and universities that actually encourage engineers to get um, off campus and to immerse themselves in other cultures. So the advantage to you is you're developing cult cultural competencies and you are making yourself a more competitive job candidate because this is a global economy that we're living in and um, future employers are gonna be excited to hear that you took the time to go to another place to study and, um, and to do uh, hands-on uh, professional experiences through an internship or a co-op or some other uh, study abroad experience. Um, the other, uh, obvious way you can gain experience outside the classroom is through internships or co-op experiences. I'll give um, my home institution as an example at Wentworth, 100% of our students do two co-ops over the course of their four years. So we believe so strongly that the co-op experience is essential to your future success in these fields that it's a graduation requirement um, it's also, oh, by the way, a great way to help earn money while you're in college. So we're, we're not talking a lot about college finances, but when you think about your success as a student, um, part of that hinges on your ability to pay the bill in the short term and your ability to get a job in the long term. And when you're in a co-op setting or working as an intern, you're interacting in a professional setting with people in a position to either hire you or to write recommendations in support of your candidacy for a future job. You're also developing a professional network, which is going to be very important to your future success. Um, and, and sometimes as you go through your four years of college, um, you can get so immersed in the day-to-day -day academic life that you forget where you're headed the internship and the co-op experience allows you to test the waters in a field that you think you might enjoy after you graduate. Um, and, and you get to do that and find out if your hypothesis is correct while you're still enrolled as a student. And then finally, I, I wanted to put in a big plug for research. Um, some students are intimidated by the idea of doing research while in college. It might sound daunting, but in truth, it's a great way to roll up your sleeves and work with professors on problems that haven't been solved and helping to create new knowledge in a variety of different fields. That work that you do, the research that you do as an undergraduate could be a way for you to publish along with the professor and other students if the findings are significant from the research work you're doing. It's also potentially a way for you to publish, um, sorry, to present at a national conference. So it's not all that crazy to think about as an undergraduate going to uh, a conference and presenting the results of your research, which again is a, is a great learning experience and a good um, professional skill. So with that, I will turn the floor back to Amy. Or no, 
Chris. Chris. Yeah, I think, uh, thanks, Chris. And I think uh, each of us as panelists, we will give a, a quick, uh, very brief, but summary of, of our particular institutions. And we have some really tremendous uh, universities and, uh, on the panel here uh, for you to look to, to learn about. So as I mentioned, I'm with the McKelvey School of Engineering at Washington University in St. Louis. We're in St. Louis, Missouri, as it's in our title. Uh, and again, I'm directly connected to our engineering school. And uh, with that, uh, some things that, that highlight us uh, as a program, we're a bit non-traditional uh, as an engineering program. We're a little bit smaller than you sometimes see at schools our size for in, uh, in terms of how big the engineering school is. Uh, we're very proud of that. We have about 1,400 undergraduate students in McKelvey. We're very non-traditional in our research portfolio of our faculty. Uh, the problems that our engineering faculty work to solve, it's, it's a very unique collection. We're an incredibly collaborative place. Um, as it's, a, it's a challenging environment, but a very collaborative environment. And that second bullet point is, was, was uh, some of the themes I was trying to mention just about being involved. Uh, we're very proud of, of our McKelvey engineers at WashU and how well represented they are throughout all of campus, especially in things like athletics and um, student government and the fine and performing arts. Uh, Kristen mentioned the importance of research. Uh, that is huge for us, and we especially promote it for our undergraduate students uh, in our program. Same for entrepreneurship opportunities. Uh, engineers are just by trade, creative, innovative, uh, people. And so the research and entrepreneurship plays into that. Uh, and we're in an incredibly supportive environment. And I think you'll find that from all of our institutions, uh, engineering specifically, all of STEM can be very challenging, but advice would be to find schools that are challenging you, but are also supporting you. And I think you'll get that from all three, uh, uh, four, sorry, of our institutions uh, today. So just real quick, these are the list of our majors within engineering. Um, so just a summary of that, I'll have my contact info we all will at the end of our presentation that you could reach out if you have any specific questions about our majors. Uh, and these are just the big themes within our program uh, that we've already, it's things that we've uh, hit, uh, hit on already, uh, but uh, research and hands-on work, uh, entrepreneurship is big within our program. Again, getting involved. Uh, and we are lucky enough to have uh, brand new facilities in our engineering program of a big uh, in, uh, project that just happened uh, at the university. So those are just, a, that's real quick, I know, but each of us uh, will give a quick pitch here and those are some uh, great highlights to our program and uh, we'd be happy to field any questions about our program or anything we've talked about at the end. Thank you. And we'll hand it off now to, to Amy and Purdue. Awesome, thanks, Chris. Um, yeah, again, this is Amy Glenn from Purdue University. We'll just touch really quickly on some of the highlights of Purdue. We are a large university. Um, but with still kind of a small college vibe, you can kind of make it what you want it to be by getting involved, as everyone talked about. Um, those student organizations, uh, clubs, sports, that's how you make a large, large university feel much smaller and close-knit. Um, a little bit about Purdue, uh, 35,000 undergraduate students. There are nine colleges and 200 majors. 72% of students, undergraduate students here at Purdue are in a STEM major. Um, we do have 2,000 undergraduate research projects going on on any given year, uh, so there's lots of ways to get involved there. You get to continue your passion or pursue new interests, so if you like to try juggling and unicycling, we most certainly have a club for that, um, and you could just try some fun new things and get that real-world experience like, like we've talked about. Those are all very important, and all of our schools do support that. A little bit about Purdue Engineering specifically. We are our top 10 engineering program. Uh, we offer a first year engineering experience, which will, gives you time to explore all 17 different majors that we offer here at Purdue. Um, you can check our website for more information about each of those specific majors. And then you can also specialize within those majors. So there's about 80 different flavors of engineering uh, to choose from, which is why we give you the full first year to figure it out. We are a top industry pick for recruiters. We have over 30 career fairs here on campus throughout the year, over 1,700 unique employer visits in a normal year. Um, and when I say 1,700 unique, um, GE visits multiple times because they have multiple divisions, but they're only counted once. Uh, average starting salary, our average salary for co-ops and internships uh, is about 20 to $30 an hour. So as Kristen mentioned, this is a great way to help pay for college uh, through co-ops and internships. As I like to say, engineering students do not work for free. 
working for free is important because that's called volunteering, but that is something different. Uh, the average starting salary for our engineers is about 72,000 a year, and we have over 100,000 living alums worldwide who love to give back and love to get involved. A few, a few unique things about Purdue Engineering, we ha do have the first women in engineering program in the U.S. 26% of our engineering students are women, uh, so ladies, you would not be alone here at Purdue. We do have the largest and longest established uh, student chapter of SWE, and we have a brand new women in STEM residence hall, which allows our uh, women, women students to collaborate much more easily. We are the birthplace of the National Society of Black Engineers. We have one of the first minority engineering programs in the U.S., which offers a lot of resources, both for those students looking, to, looking for college, but also uh, as retention once you get here. Both of these programs, Women in Engineering and the Minority Engineering Program, are open to all students, no matter gender or ethnicity. Um, and all students do participate. So it's really cool to see students collaborating together. We are a very collaborative university. So that first year experience, they'll be on a team of four working on at least one or two real world projects uh, because we feel that uh, engineering is a team sport and that should actually happen in the classroom. We are the cradle of astronauts. We've got 26 astronauts um, that have gone into space, which is pretty exciting. Gus Grissom, which was the second American in space. Neil Armstrong, the first man on the moon. Um, and Gene Cernan, the most recent person on the moon. They're always loving for, uh, to see more go back. So I'm going to turn it over to Sarah at Rose Holman. Thank you, Amy. So Rose Holman is a small private college and we are located in Terre Haute, Indiana. Um, we have, maybe would you be able to go to the next slide for me, please? There we go. Uh, we have just over 2,000 students, and that's undergraduate and graduate students combined, 25% um, of which are female. Our class sizes are really small, as is our faculty to student, or sorry, the student to faculty ratio, which really helps us to live out our mission of individual attention and support. So we are a teaching focused institution. And so our number one priority is student learning. And that's what you're gonna find with our faculty, with their open door policies, um, with their office hours. We have 19 undergraduate degrees in engineering, math and science, um, including optical engineering, as well as engineering design. We've also got eight graduate programs. And this year we launched a new and exciting program called Rose Squared where students who have some college credit already coming to campus can earn both a Bachelor of Science degree as well as a Master of Engineering Management in just four years. Um, outside of the classroom, we've got over 100 clubs, teams, organizations, plus the typical Greek life, varsity athletics, performing arts, study abroad opportunities, and so much more. Um, our placement rates are high as, long, as well as our average starting salary. And we've been um, recognized nationally by a lot of um, different organizations. And if you're familiar with US News and World Report, we've been ranked the number one engineering school for the past 23 years straight. So that's just a little bit about Rose Holman and I'll turn it over to Kristen to talk more about Wentworth. Thank you, Sarah. Um, I, uh, I'm gonna have you advance to the next slide, Amy. I'll give you a whirlwind tour of Wentworth campus, we are smack dab in the heart of the Fenway district in Boston. Uh, there are a bazillion college students and college campuses in Boston. Um, we are actually a member of the colleges of the Fenway consortium. So you have easy access to facilities and future friends at all of those different campuses. It's a very exciting place to go to college. Next slide. Um, within that campus community, you have access to world-class facilities, accelerate labs and maker spaces to test the waters in a variety of ways and do lots of hands-on project work. Next slide. Um, as I mentioned before, all of our students as, the, uh, oh, as part of their undergraduate experience get to do a couple of co-ops. They earn money, again, uh, that is not um, not to be uh, dispensed with. It's just a nice way to um, gain experience and help your um, finances as you go through college. And we have, as the locals would say, a wicked high um, hiring rate for our students. 96% of those who cross the stage 
um, are snapped up by future employers. Next slide. Um, and it's a close knit community. So even though we're in a big city, we have a campus proper, students live on campus, 16 to one student faculty ratio, and um, all of our classes are taught by our faculty. Next slide. Um, and, and to give you a sense, we have about 4,400 undergraduate students in a wide range of programs within STEM and design and um, management, construction management as well. And that is it for me with Wentworth. So now is your chance to ask questions of us. If you have a question, you can type it into the chat. I think there is a, a first one in the, the Q and A, um, and I think we can all speak to this one. Um, the uh, asking for each of our schools if we have fee waivers uh, for uh, applications, and at Washington University we do. I would imagine most schools do. Anyone else want to speak to their institutions? So through the individual institutions, you can always request a fee waiver. As Chris noted, that's a pretty universal opportunity. And then um, the College Board and the National Association of College Admissions Counselors, these are professional associations that offer fee waivers to students. And your high school counselor can help you identify um, fee waivers as well, because it is expensive. There's a question about what makes a successful student at, at our colleges individually. I would say at, at Wentworth, um, it's really diving into the curriculum. So uh, Amy talked a little bit about how every school is structured a little bit differently. And so at, at Purdue, for example, your first year, you're gonna get a smattering of coursework in lots of different engineering disciplines. Um, if you study engineering at Wentworth, you're gonna dive right into the curriculum in whatever field you are interested in studying. So it's really good for you to figure out what the differences are from school to school and what you are looking for, what happens to be the best fit for you. Yeah, I would say from Purdue's standpoint, what makes a successful student is is a student who's interested, and it is, would apply, I think, for all of our schools, is a student that's willing to do the work and then some. So not just settling for, this is what I've been, assi been assigned to do in class, and so this is what I'm going to do, but actually going deeper. It's like, well, this is what I'm assigned to do, but how do I make it better? How do I make more improvements? Or how can I go that extra step? Um, because that's really what makes a successful student because they're looking at it at things from different perspectives. Uh, so that would be my suggestion is, is being willing to do the work and then some. I'll add one more thing which we've talked about offline as a group, which is um, sometimes students who are excited about studying STEM are not really good at asking for help. And you may have really excelled in your secondary school but I can promise you, you will have something come up during your first year of college that is going to stop you in your tracks. And that's to be expected. And so um, I would encourage you, we would all encourage you to seek out opportunities to um, speak to your academic advisor, your faculty member, if there's a teaching assistant for the class to join a study group, but um, don't suffer silently find people who can help you because on every college campus, there are people whose job it is to, to help you through those rough patches. I think another strategy that makes for successful students is just shifting from very passive strategies where you're just passively receiving information from your teachers to active strategies where you're actually engaging with material 
and you're learning how to apply the material in different ways and not, like I said, just memorizing everything the night before an exam because that doesn't work anymore in college. So learning those better strategies that will help you be efficient with your time, but also more effective. So the next question we have here is about test scores. And um, can you discuss test optional and the importance of test scores uh, and more specific courses you may wanna see in high school? Um, really quickly from our standpoint is, uh, we just did some research on this. As far as uh, students who succeed in engineering at Purdue, they have, they did the classes that would help prepare them for the rigors of college, but specifically students that, that did math, science, and foreign language of all things um, really helped them to prepare because I think that was using both sides of the brain in order to learn that foreign language. Now we don't re require foreign language to graduate from Purdue, but most certainly it, looks, it appears that it does help students in preparing to succeed in STEM. Um, as far as tests optional, our recommendation is if a student does great on their on that test, uh, great, submit the scores. If not, it's optional this year. Now I can't say that every year, but um, we are test, uh, I should say flexible this year. So, uh, so those SATs and those ACTs are not necessarily, we'll look at them, but they're not going to be a deciding factor necessarily between one student versus another. Um, I'll, I'll chime in quickly to say that, of course, with COVID, um, the lack of test administration made a lot of institutions go test optional. Um, uh, across the country, there are more and more institutions every year that are adopting test optional policies on an annual basis. In STEM, I think techie institutions have actually been kind of slow to adopt a test optional policy because we love numbers, right, and faculty in our various engineering schools are really risk averse. They're, they're nervous about uh, what, what might happen uh, to the admissions process, um, the selection process, if we don't have test scores uh, at our disposal. Um, that said, there are many institutions that even before the pandemic hit were test optional. Wentworth, for example, is one of them. And, um, and in terms of coursework, great question. What happens when we don't have a test score is, of course, we're going to look even more carefully at your course program. And within that, the rigor of the courses that you're taking. We view senior year in particular as the foundation for the work you're going to be doing as a first year student on our campuses. So um, sort of to, to piggyback on a comment Amy made earlier, we're looking for students who go above and beyond the bare minimum and um, challenge themselves, especially in areas of interest to them. And we recognize every school is different, that um, you may have limits to what kinds of courses are available to you from a scheduling standpoint or just because of the school's offerings, but we are looking to see that within those constraints, you're, you're pushing yourself and, uh, and working hard. Fantastic. So, man, lots of great questions. And I just want to throw this out there. If we do not get to your question because of time this evening, please feel free to reach out to us individually. You see, should see my screen still uh, with our, our uh, emails and our names. So please feel free to contact us or go to our websites. There's lots of great information on all our websites too. You might find the answers to your questions there, but also uh, feel free to reach out to us. Um, Chris or Sarah, do you see any questions that you would like to tackle? So I see one that asked about the recommendation of three hours per credit hour, and that is per week. And so being a student is your full-time job. And so you can expect to be putting in full-time hours towards your classes. So yes, that is per week. Yeah. Um, and there, the, one I'll grab just real quick. Someone, great question about athletics. And I and they've noticed that we're all three division. Well, uh, Purdue would be division one uh, athletics. Uh, and I think the rest of us are division three. But for at Washington University, we're a D3 school. We have lots of engineers that are uh, in athletics. Uh, but we the question was about athletic scholarships. And we do not. And I think that is a, a pretty universal thing across division three that there would not be athletic specific scholarships. And, and that is the case that there are not at, at WashU. 
Awesome. One of the questions that I saw here that I would love to know as well for myself. So what is the difference between an institute of technology versus a university? So would one of you like to take that? Well, I'll let Sarah chime in as well. But um, what, what I will say from my experience is there are a number of colleges and universities in the United States and in Europe that are part of a, a polytechnic tradition. I think the word came from polytechnique in France initially. So these were institutions whose mission was squarely focused on um, science and technology and engineering quite specifically. Um, and uh, the, the interesting thing is that you can pursue undergraduate and graduate degrees in those disciplines at a college or at a university, the polytechnics like Rensselaer, WPI, MIT, Wentworth, Rose Hullman, um, what you find on our campuses is a more focused academic experience so that everyone on the campus for the most part is studying some flavor of science or engineering. Sarah, do you wanna to add to that? I was just gonna add that I think it's just tradition. We started out as Rose Polytechnic Institute and that name like from the 1800s. And so the name just kind of carried forward. And so that's really the only difference that I see. And that, I think that's a great explanation. Thank you, Kristen uh, and, and, and Sarah, um, because our College of Technology recently changed their name to the Polytechnic Institute. And sometimes that's confusing for people um, because it's like, well, are you Purdue or are you a are you separate from Purdue? So um, Purdue University is the umbrella. And then under that umbrella, we have these different colleges, engineering being one of those, science being one of those, and the Polytechnic Institute being one of those. So excellent. Um, other questions, let's see. Um, did anyone see one they wanted to add? Someone about Rose Holman's uh, Rose Squared program. And we can give you more details offline for sure. But basically, if you come in with about 30 credit hours, we can get you both of those programs finished in four years. And some of that can be your humanities, your literary credits. Um, and so we could definitely talk offline and get you connected with the right people to, to evaluate what credits you have if you'd like to you know, more, know more information about that program. And there, I know we, we might run up against time because this is a great question uh, that we could spend another hour on probably, but how our institutions have handled the last 18 months, how we're handling COVID uh, and how it's affecting campus life. Um, at Washington University, of course, last year and continues to be a challenging time. Uh, we are, this year is, is better in terms of we've had uh, all in-person courses, which was not the case last year. Uh, so there's a, there is definitely a lot more energy back uh, in our campus and our student life, but it was a, a definitely very challenging and continues to be a challenging time. Uh, one thing I, I meant to mention off the, the introductions is that the last year and a half has shown us a lot of things. Uh, one thing that is very clear, I think, to all of us on the panel and really to anyone who's paying attention is the need for you all watching us, for prospective students to go into these fields. Uh, we need you for the next, uh, hopefully not the next global pandemic anytime soon, uh, but other challenges that we just need really smart, creative people uh, to solve really, really challenging problems. So I think it's really shined a light on a lot of things, but um, an area that we've always known is that we need uh, really, really good problem solvers to take on some challenging uh, areas. Um, so anyway, I'll get off my soapbox there, but uh, any others want to speak to how, how your campuses have been the last year? Um, I'll, I'll share that um, we're subject to all of the guidelines, health guidelines associated with the city of Boston. And so um, we are generally speaking, masking inside, at least at this point in time, not outside. Um, students are thrilled to be back on campus, we actually have a summer semester. So 
we were back last summer and we're back again this fall. Um, and uh, I personally am thrilled to see people in three dimensions again, uh, long overdue. Um, I, I, I will say that one thing that uh, I think all of us enjoy is working with students who understand the science. So <laughs> they tend to be um, really good at observing some of the health guidelines. So with that, I am back to conclude this, uh, this session. So thank you for joining us. Thank you to our panelists. When you close this window, there will be a link to a very quick five question survey. We'd appreciate any feedback that you can provide. And we encourage you to check back on the schedule to sign up for more sessions. Uh, you'll be able to find this session's recording uh, as well as all of the other session recordings at strivescan.com forward slash cache. Thank y'all so much.